thanks again for joining us for this uh, webinar. Um, we'll be talking about the musculoskeletal ultrasound uh, upper extremity course, and I'll just give you a little bit of a preview. As far as disclosures, I do have some disclosures. Uh, I received an honorarium from Terrason for assisting with their educational programs. I don't sell their machines or anything, and certainly that's not part of this talk or the course, uh, but I do receive an honorarium for them for educational products. Um, so first I'm going to talk about what musculoskeletal ultrasound is. Then I'll give you an overview of how it is being used in clinical practice and, and its impact on clinical practice, so sort of the pros and cons of it. I'll give you a clinical vignette uh, and some course information, uh, and then I will answer questions from you. By the way, down in the lower part of your screen, hopefully you're seeing the video, that's a flexor pollicis longus going through your thenar eminence, so you can really see that tendon nicely in the mus musculature there. So what is musculoskeletal ultrasound? It's using high-frequency sound waves, and these, these uh, sound waves are very, very high frequency, between 3 and 17 uh, megahertz, and we can hear up to 20,000 uh, hertz, so way, way, way below that. Um, and it's used to image soft tissues and bony surfaces. So we're essentially just sending sound waves into these tissues. They reflect back, and we produce uh, images from that information. And it really has unbelievable fine uh, detail. It's high resolution, higher resolution than MRI for superficial structures. Um, for instance, if you look down at that flexor pollicis longus uh, tendon going through the thenar eminence there, you can see the collagen bundles in that, whereas if you were looking at it with MRI, all you'd see if it was normal is a, is a dark line, um, and that would be normal tendon. So you can see a lot more of the um, infrastructure within the tendon itself with ultrasound. Ultrasound's been with us for quite a while. Um, back in the 1930s and 40s, they started uh, experimenting with uh, sound waves, of course, for military purposes, like a lot of things in medicine. Uh, they come from a military background, but then it was changed over after the war was over um, to medical purposes. So in 1949, John Wilde was the first person to actually use ultrasounds to image any structure, and it was uh, bowel wall tissue that he was looking at. Now, interestingly, only a couple of years later, a bunch of physiatrists actually founded the American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine. Now, originally, that organization was actually founded based on uh, therapeutic ultrasound as opposed to diagnostic ultrasound. Um, but it's evolved over time, and now it's not an organization that's just physiatrists. It's uh, multiple different uh, specialties, uh, including physician specialists as well as sonographers. And it probably is the largest organization representing uh, ultrasound within the United States. In 1962, they made a big leap forward in terms of ultrasound technology when they came up with B-mode scanners. And what B stands for is brightness. And so it gives variable uh, gray colors to, um, to different sound or electrical impulses that are coming back from your sound waves. And so it gave a lot of different shades of gray, and that allowed uh, more uh, specific diagnostic imaging. You could see things better. In the 1980s, they started uh, using higher frequency probes. And at that point, you could see musculoskeletal structures quite well. So that's when people started really experimenting with ultrasounds to determine if ultrasound worked for musculoskeletal applications. And in the 1990s, as Things were miniaturized, so it wasn't a giant room full of equipment. It was actually you know, a relatively portable machine. The cost came down, and the resolution improved. People started buying these machines and using them in office-based practices. And so now it's being used for both diagnostic and interventional uh, purposes uh, by physicians, not only radiologists, but other specialists, including, of course, physiatrists. So what does ultrasound image best? The ideal situation is a superficial structure, because then you can use a higher frequency probe. The deeper the structure, the lower the frequency uh, that you have to use. And uh, lower frequency does not have as high a resolution as high frequency. In addition, you can use a probe that has a flat um, surface at the end. That's a linear array probe. The ones that have a curved surface are usually low frequency probes, and, uh, and they're better for imaging deep structures, but uh, they are very susceptible to an artifact called anisotropy, and so they're not the ideal thing for diagnostic ultrasound. 
Um, ultrasound is also better for localized problems. If somebody comes in and they say, you know, my whole ankle hurts, then it will take you forever to look at every structure in your ankle with ultrasound. Uh, so it's not great for a generalized uh, examination. It's better for focal um, problems, such as you know somebody who comes in and says, I have posterior lateral ankle pain. I probably wouldn't say posterior lateral, but <laughs> you get my meaning. Down here in the lower right, by the way, um, over here is uh, lateral. This is medial over here. This is superficial and deep. This is the uh, humerus coming around here. This is a calcific deposit within the rotator cuff, and this is bringing an 18-gauge needle into that calcific deposit to lavage and aspirate it so it can be used to treat calcific tendinopathy, particularly in the rotator cuff. So in clinical practice, we use ultrasound for all sorts of different things. From a diagnostic standpoint, it is fantastic looking at tendons, muscles, nerves, ligaments, and it can look for periarticular things such as uh, periarticular joint erosions, synovitis, and it can see joint effusions within various joint recesses. Um, for interventional purposes, you can use ultrasound for all sorts of different things, whether they're injections or tenotomies. Like I was talking about before, you can lavage and aspirate calcific deposits. You can do releases of tendons and ligaments. Um, for instance, you can do a trigger finger release or even a percutaneous carpal tunnel release using ultrasound guidance, and it's being used by uh, other specialties predominantly for, for biopsies. Down here in the lower right-hand corner, uh, this is proximal, this is distal, superficial, and deep. This is over the proximal interphalangeal joint, so this is the proximal phalanx, this is the metacarpal head. Right here is the volar plate. Right there is your flexor digitorum, uh, profundus and superficialis tendons. They pretty much blend together, so they're hard to differentiate at this level. But direct, directly over uh, your volar plate is your A1 pulley, and so it's this dark line right up here. And so this really small 27-gauge, 1 and a quarter inch needle was guided in just deep to the pulley and superficial to the, uh, to the flexor tendons, and it's doing an injection into the um, tendon sheath of somebody with a trigger finger. So uh, some of the advantages of musculoskeletal ultrasound relative to other imaging modalities, number one, I think one of the biggest advantages is that it uh, images in real time. So it allows us to look at things dynamically. Almost all of our other imaging studies are static images, whether it's a CT, MRI, or X-ray. And certainly fluoro is dynamic, but it's, you know, you're not going to do a prolonged fluoro shot to look at uh, specific uh, tissues usually. And also the fluoro shot, of course, is not going to give you any soft tissue information, really, um, other than possibly a ligament ruptured. And you can see uh, opening of a joint and instability of a joint, but you're not going to see that ligament. So you can see soft tissues. It's dynamic. Um, and this is great when you want to evaluate something that uh, moving the, t the structure around is going to help you with your diagnosis. Um, and for instance, if somebody comes in and they say that their ankle is popping and you suspect that they have perineal tendon subluxation, then you can image their perineal tendons as you have them put their ankle through the range of motion that would cause their symptoms and uh, watch what happens with those perineal tendons as they're experiencing their pop and see if those are truly what's causing the problem. So I really like that uh, dynamic imaging. And uh, not only can you use that dynamic imaging from a diagnostic standpoint, but you can also uh, use it from an interventional standpoint. Since you have real-time uh, imaging, you can guide a needle into various areas in order to perform procedures. Another really nice thing is that it allows uh, interaction with your patients. So you see a patient, you do the history and physical examination, you suspect a diagnosis, and you can do this examination. You can focus your examination uh, in order to obtain the information that you're specifically looking for. And while you're doing that, you can show the patient on the screen exactly what's going on. And there was actually a study comparing patient satisfaction following an MRI versus an ultrasound for shoulder problems. And uh, of course, the uh, patients preferred ultrasound to uh, MRI uh, significantly. They really, they really. Uh, appreciated the fact that they weren't held in one position. They were interacting with their physician, getting immediate feedback in terms of information and so on. It's much higher patient satisfaction, and that certainly improves your practice. 
Um, it's not as susceptible to artifact as, as other imaging modalities. Now, certainly you can't see through metal, but you can see things superficial to metal. So if you have somebody who had external, uh, or excuse me, an ORIF procedure for a fracture, and they still have hardware um, in place, and they're experiencing pain around that hardware, you can image that area and see if there's soft tissue that's rubbing on it, such as a tendon that crosses over that area. You can look for soft tissue, uh, excuse me, or fluid collections. Um, and if there are fluid collections, then you can, of course, aspirate it and send it for a culture and sensitivity. So uh, it's really nice when somebody has metal um, in their body, such as a total hip arthroplasty, because you, can, you really can uh, image that area. Another thing that's nice is you can use your contralateral limb for control. So if you're looking at somebody's common extensor tendon origin um, in their elbow, and you think they might have some pathology, but you're not quite sure, you can quick take a look on the contralateral extremity and compare, and that really helps you determine whether something is normal or abnormal. And of course, you can't do that when you're using uh, MRI or CT. Or if you do do it, it's very expensive and time consuming. Um, ultrasound is portable, very, very hard to move MRI from machine to, or from room to room or from office to office, but certainly packing up your ultrasound machine if it is a portable machine and, and uh, taking it to the sidelines if you're a sports medicine physician or to one office or another if you just have multiple different sites where you see patients uh, is really handy. And it's relatively inexpensive, whether you're comparing it to um, purchasing an MRI or x-ray machine, or whether you're talking about the actual cost of the study itself for the patient. So you buying the equipment, it's way cheaper, and the patient paying for it, it is way, way cheaper. And in fact, there was a nice study done by Parker et al. back in 2008 that showed that if we use ultrasound appropriately, specifically for shoulder examinations, then uh, we would save $6.9 billion over a 14-year period. And that's strictly uh, looking at it in the United States and only for shoulder. So imagine if we use this for uh, broader applications besides just looking at the shoulder. Uh, significant cost savings, obviously, um, associated with ultrasound. I think this is nice that it doesn't expose you or your patients to radiation, and there's no known contraindications to diagnostic ultrasound. But just like anything else, it's not perfect. Um, you have to consider the disadvantages when you're looking at using it. One of the things is it has a limited field of view. Um, you're essentially looking at a credit card thin slice of, of tissue when you have an ultrasound over an area, and you have to actually go and find your picture. If you stick somebody into an MRI machine, it's going to spit out the exact same uh, pictures regardless of who the patient is. It just follows its computer algorithm. But if you're doing an ultrasound, you actually have to manipulate the probe, find the structure you're interested in, optimize the image, and make sure that you're looking at either a normal structure or a pathologic structure and uh, exclude any artifact. So <clears throat> that limited field of view means that you have to take a lot of time in order to obtain your images. It does an incomplete evaluation of bones and joints. You can't see through bones, and so you can't see into joints. So uh, certainly an MRI is still going to be very, very important for certain conditions, such as meniscal tear or an ACL tear. You just can't see those very well with ultrasound. And they have limited penetration. I was working for a long time up in Minnesota. Now I'm in Lake Tahoe, so we have a relatively thin population. But up in Minnesota, we had a fairly large population. And that, of course, uh, inhibits your ability to image somebody with ultrasound. It is operator dependent. When I was talking about the limited field of view and the fact that you had to go and get your image and you're only looking at a credit card thin slice, well, you have to go and get the image, so it's operator dependent. You have to be able to find the structure you're interested in and then optimize the image and determine whether there's pathology. And that just takes time to learn, just like anything else. Um, one issue is evolving certification and accreditation standards. Now, when I first uh, put together talks on ultrasound, there was no such thing as accreditation or certification in musculoskeletal ultrasound, but things have evolved since that time. And now you can get your practice accredited by the AIUM, or you can sit for a board certification uh, through the ARDMS. And both of those help, um, <clears throat> particularly when you're talking about third-party payers. Because if you, I mean, one of the big issues is people will go to a weekend course and then go back home, buy a machine, and immediately start billing patients for diagnostic and interventional ultrasound. And so because this can be done, um, 
and people are doing it, there's been an exponential increase in the utilization of ultrasound. And of course, insurance companies and the government monitor utilization. And when utilization goes through the roof on something, they want to investigate and figure out why it's going through the roof. And uh, one of the things that they found is that utilization is not going up in radiology. It's going up in other specialties. And so they're curious, what is your training and should you be doing this? So by either getting your practice accredited by the AIUM or by getting board certified by the ARDMS, you're at least establishing that you have uh, a specific level of knowledge uh, and are following specific protocols when you're evaluating people with ultrasound. And, uh, and that can be used when you're uh, talking to third party payers and uh, proving that you are an expert in this area. Now, while the equipment is a lot less expensive than an MRI or an X-ray or a CT, it still costs, you know, thirty or forty thousand dollars to get most uh, units that people are interested in for our uses. And uh, you know, the more money you spend, um, the more bells and whistles, but also uh, the higher resolution machine you can get. And so, there, it's not free. You do you have to buy a machine? And the more you spend on it, probably the better machine you're going to get. Um, so just realize that. Um, now I'm just going to give you a little bit of a clinical vignette um, talking about how uh, one case uh, I, I used ultrasound in my practice. And obviously I use this every day, so this is just one, one case, um, but it's kind of an interesting one. So this guy was a 23-year-old right-hand dominant male weightlifter who had been lifting for years. He's a pretty big guy, and he started developing painful snapping in the anterior aspect of his shoulder. And the snap was uh, associated with a sharp pain that didn't radiate, uh, got up to a 5 out of 10 in severity, and was increased when he would do horizontal abduction, so uh, kind of doing a cable cross um, uh, type of maneuver, or with uh, overhead motions in, in an abducted and externally rotated position of his shoulder, so military press and that type of thing. Um, when he would avoid those activities, it really didn't bother him, so it would feel better with rest and avoidance. So he took a month off from weightlifting, um, and his symptoms, of course, felt better while he took a month off. But uh, the second he went back to weightlifting, his snapping came back. So then he went to rehab for a couple of months, and uh, it still just didn't improve. So he went and uh, saw one of my partners who got some x-rays on him, and the x-rays uh, were normal, so then he thought, well, maybe this is a labral tear um, or uh, some other pathology uh, that was soft tissue in that area, so he got an MRI arthrogram. The MRI arthrogram didn't show any significant pathology, so he sent him to me for an ultrasound, specifically uh, looking to see if he had a dislocating biceps tendon. So the first thing I did is looked at the biceps tendon, so here is lateral, here is medial, this is the lesser tuberosity, the greater tuberosity, the intertubercular groove with the biceps tendon, long head of the biceps tendon, sitting in the intertubercular groove. This is the transverse humeral ligament going over the top of it, superficial in this area, is the anterior deltoid. And his tendon looked normal. There was no effusion. There was no evidence of tendinopathy or tenus synovitis in that area. So then I did a dynamic examination. Here he is moving from an internally to an externally rotated position. And I was watching the biceps tendon specifically to see if it would dislocate as I would go back and forth between internal and external rotation. And his biceps tendon stays nicely centered right in the groove. And there, there was no evidence that this tendon was either subluxing or dislocating. Despite that, while I was doing this examination, I could feel a snap. So it was deaf, something was snapping, but it wasn't the biceps tendon. So then I moved the biceps tendon, or excuse me, the, rota the uh, ultrasound probe just medial to the biceps tendon. Here's that biceps tendon. Here's the lesser tuberosity. Here's the subscapularis tendon right here. And sitting right over the top of that, you can see this tissue snapping back and forth underneath this tissue bundle. So this tissue bundle is your uh, conjoint tendon, which is the short head of the biceps. Uh, and the coracobrachialis, and here's your pec minor. And this thing right here is a subcoracoid bursa with significant bursal hypertrophy. So it's snapping back and forth underneath that uh, conjoint tendon and pec minor with internal and external rotation of his shoulder. 
and uh, it had hyperemia in it, and so it was inflamed based on uh, looking at it and seeing that hyperemia. So he was diagnosed with subcoracoid bursopathy um, secondary to subcoracoid impingement. So he was given multiple different treatment options, but he opted for an arthroscopic subcoracoid bursa resection and coracoid decompression. Now, you guys are all probably familiar with the three types of impingement in your shoulder. There's subcromial impingement, internal impingement, and subcoracoid impingement. And subcoracoid impingement typically occurs when you horizontally adduct your arm, so like if you're reaching across to your contralateral shoulder, and that will approximate your coracoid process against your lesser tuberosity, and so it'll pinch tissues in between that area. But he had symptoms when he would get into an abducted and externally rotated position, so it was a totally different mechanism of injury. So we hypothesized that maybe because he was a weightlifter and he was doing a lot of strength testing, uh, maybe his subscapularis had, been, had hypertrophied and was taking up a lot of the space. And so we imaged him with his arm in internal rotation. So here's his coracoid. This is medial and lateral. So here's his coracoid process. Here's the lesser tuberosity. Uh, here's his subscapularis tendon, and we measured the distance between the coracoid process and his lesser tuberosity and the thickness of his uh, subscapularis in an internally rotated position. The distance uh, between the coracoid process and lesser tuberosity was 1.92 centimeters, and the thickness of his subscapularis was 0 0.538 centimeters. But then we took him into external rotation, and now his... Uh, his uh, subscapularis tendon is 1.35 centimeters, so it nearly tripled in terms of its size, even though the distance, of course, between the coracoid and the humerus hadn't changed. So the subscapularis was filling up this entire area, and then as he would uh, push his arm overhead, so he'd be in an abduct and externally rotated position, uh, such as in a military press with his arms down at shoulder, with his hands at shoulder height, and then he would push straight up overhead and it would rub that subcoracoid bursa between his subscapularis and his coracoid, and that's what caused his symptoms. And so kind of an interesting thing that you really couldn't see uh, with anything other than ultrasound. So um, after all of that, uh, here's a little bit of information about the course. So that upper extremity course is from March 22nd through the 24th. Um, the lectures will be for five hours of the course. But almost, you know, a significant majority of the course is uh, going to be spent with hands-on uh, scanning. So eight hours of that is going to be cadaver time, and eight hours of that is going to be diagnostic time. So you're going to have a lot of exposure um, both to the diagnostic and interventional uh, components of, of musculoskeletal ultrasound for the upper extremity. And because we do have cadavers, you're going to be able to practice all sorts of different uh, procedures whether they're periarticular or intraarticular injections, peritendinous injections, tenotomies, and so on. Uh, so it really gives you a lot of time to work on that. There will also be ultrasound vendors on site, so you can check out different machines and see if uh, any of them interest you. Of course, it's going to be in Las Vegas, which can be a pretty fun town. That weekend happens to be the weekend of the Big Ten playoffs, so uh, you could catch a game if you wanted to. We do have a reception during the course, which is uh, a lot of fun, um, and that's paid for by the Academy, uh, and it's an open bar. Uh, after the course, you know, it's definitely important to practice, because obviously if you learn all these skills and you go home and you don't use them, then you lose them. So either purchase a machine, or if you have a machine, then start practicing, uh, or if you don't have a machine, see if you can borrow one or go into the vascular lab and use their ultrasound machine. But really, really try to practice. And uh, one of the cool things that we're offering with this course is about six weeks after the course, um, we're going to let you do. We're going to do something like a, another webinar or a conference call, and we're going to we're going to talk about any. We're going to try to answer any questions that you have. So you go to the course, you learn various things, you go back and you try to put it into practice. And six weeks later, if you have any questions, you can ask them at that time because. Not uh, everything is apparent when you're at the course. You know, you learn a lot uh, or have a lot of questions sometimes when you go back home. So I think that's pretty nice, and it's a free part of the course. Um, the registration rates, if you're a member, uh, it's uh, $2,250, and if you're a non-member, it's uh, $2,800. 
It's going to be at, the hotel is going to be at Planet Hollywood, um, and the uh, hotel room rate is two hundred and nine dollars. The registration is limited, so it's really important to register early. We've already got a lot of people registered for the course, and so you, if you're interested, you don't want it to fill up and uh, and miss out because this course, uh, in general, has been offered every other year. So it'll be a couple of years before you have another opportunity to uh, take this course. And uh, that is it. We hope to see you this March in Las Vegas. Specifically, I hope to see you in Las Vegas. Um, uh, we'll just uh, wrap it up now. Thank you very much for attending and hope to see you in March. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye.